In the last video, I promised you a little follow-up. Quick summary, I got potassium-40 in season 137 out of the bananas by drying and incinerating them. After filtering the washings from the ash, letting it dry up, we got a white crystalline solid made from alkali carbonates. I showed you the peaks and now we will calculate how much of each radionuclei is in these bananas. So here's the spectrum shown again in gamma vision. The spectrum was recorded over 14 hours and here I've clearly marked the peaks of cesium-137 and potassium-40. And there's the third one but I will come back to that in the very end. Now how much radioactive cesium and potassium is actually in these bananas? Calculating cesium is relatively straightforward. Why? Fortunately we don't have a cesium background as we can see in the background measurement. So I can confidently take the net area of 0.4 cps counts per second. Calculating potassium 40 is a bit more tricky because we can't rely on the automatic background correction from the Geely. The Geely detector always draws a straight line to guess the background of the spectrum. But unfortunately, as you can see in the actual background, there is still potassium 40 in it. So we have to manually calculate the background for the channels. After doing that, we can subtract it from each other and this brings us the net count area of 0.2 cps, not 0.5 cps as determined by the Geely detector. And now we can finally start the calculations. For the season 137 we now have to calculate how many 661 kilo electron gamma photons were actually emitted using the efficiency of the Geely detector. For now just accept the efficiency of the detector. I will show you in the future how you can determine its efficiency. Since not every decay results in a 661 kilo electron volt gamma photon but only 85.1% we can calculate that the activity of season 137 is 3.6 becquerel. Since the sample material came from four peeled bananas, the cesium-137 activity per banana is 0.9 becquerels. Now back to the main focus of the previous video, the potassium-40. The gross CPS of the sample was 0.48 CPS and the background was 0.28 CPS, resulting in a net CPS value of 0.2 and not 0.4 as automatically calculated by the Geely detector. Using this value, we can proceed just like we did with the cesium to obtain a result of 26.8 becquerel or 6.7 becquerel of potassium-40 per banana. This shows that the season 137 content of these bananas is actually very very low. But let's talk about the title of the video. I marked the third peak which is the peak of 511 kilo electron volts. To explain that we need to take a closer look at the decay scheme of potassium 40. Potassium 40 undergoes a beta minus decay into calcium 40 89% of the time. But it can also choose the electron capture beta plus route to argon 40 11% of the time. The 1600 kilo electron volt actually comes from the electron capture route from the excited argon daughter nucleus which falls back to the ground state forming argon 40 in the ground state. Too exciting than it actually is because gamma emissions typically only arise from these excited daughter nucleus. It's never the cesium-137 or the potassium-40, but it's actually its excited daughter nucleus. What's actually special about the beta minus decay of potassium-40 to calcium-40 is that it does not produce any gamma emissions. Why? Because, as I mentioned earlier, you would have a excited calcium-40 nucleus in order to get a gamma emission. But calcium-40 is a double magic nucleus, meaning that the proton number of 20 is magic, so very stable, and the neutron number of also 20 is also magic. So it's a very stable nucleus and you can't get an excited double magic nucleus by a normal decay. Enough beating around the bush. Where is the antimatter and where is the positronium? 0.001% of the potassium-40 decays occur through the emission of a positron directly into argon-40. This positron is antimatter. It's the antiparticle of the electron. So you could say that bananas do emit antimatter. When this positronium is ejected from the nucleus, it has a very high kinetic energy, up to a maximum of 1504 kilo electron volts. On average, it's more likely to have an energy of 197 kilo electron volts, and the remaining part of the energy goes normally to the much lighter electron neutrino. However, the ejected positron is too fast to directly annihilate with an electron. 
Along its path, it will get decelerated by several electron shells from other atoms until it slows down enough and spends enough time with an electron shell to form positronium with one of its electrons. This positronium is like an atom with a positive nucleus, except the positive charge does not come from a proton, but rather from a positron. And you don't really have a nucleus and one thing spinning around the other, but rather both orbit each other around a common center. Center. This positronium form then decays with a half-life of 0.125 nanoseconds into two gamma photons which are emitted at 180 degrees of each other with an energy of 511 kilo electron volts. So do we have definite proof that the positrons from the potassium 40 decay cause this marked 511 kilo electron volt signal that I marked earlier. No, I'm sorry, there is another source that can account for this peak known as pair production. We've seen there is a natural gamma background. If these gamma photons have at least 1022 kilo electron volts of energy and if they encounter an atomic field in an atom probably in the air or something, they can create an electron positron pair. This means that we have another source of 511 kilo electron volt gamma photons in the form of positrons once again. And this pair production from the high energy photons is way more likely than the 26 becquerels of potassium 40 which form positrons 0.001% of the time. But at least now we've learned something new. 0.9 becquerels of cesium-137 per banana, 6.7 becquerel of potassium 40 per banana and small amounts of antimatter per banana. With that being said, goodbye.